Welcome to the Not Old Better Show. I'm your host, Paul Vogelsang. As part of our Smithsonian Associates Partnership Program, our guest today, David Barron, is a science journalist, broadcaster, and the author of American Eclipse, a nation's epic race to catch the shadow of the moon and win the glory of the world. American Eclipse tells the true story of a total solar eclipse that crossed the American West in 1878. And that was a a fascinating time in American history and a fascinating time also in astronomy. And that, of course, was our guest today, David Barron, who will be appearing at the Smithsonian Associates Program, June 6, 2017, Washington, D.C., at the Ripley Center. Check out our site, notoldbetter.com, and smithsonianassociates.org for more information. David is a fascinating guest, and I'm certain you'll love this interview. David is an umbrophile. I'll let you look that up. And as someone who has witnessed five total solar eclipses. And you can find David online at American-Eclipse.com. But we've got him here today. And please join me in welcoming David Barron to the Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates Art of Living series. David Barron, welcome to the program. Thank you, Paul. Hey, I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about yourself, because you have this just this really interesting background, and then tell us a little bit about the program, which, for all the audience, will be David Barron talking about American Eclipse, the scientific rivals in the 19th century West at the Smithsonian Associates Program, June 6, 2017. David's going to be at the Ripley Center, but David's joining us today. Again, David, welcome. This is a pleasure really, to speak to you. So tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Well, thanks, Paul. So um, most of my career has been spent in public radio. I was a science correspondent for NPR back in the 90s, and uh, I spent much of the last decade with the public radio program The World, where I was uh, not on air so much. I was behind the scenes as science editor. Um, But I've been a science journalist basically since I left college. And um, I loved radio. I still love radio. But, you know, the older I've gotten, the more I've really wanted to delve into subjects in greater depth. And I, so I wrote my first book, uh, gosh, that came out in 2003. And uh, this new book is now just my second one. Uh, but at this stage of my career and stage of my life, I think I'd like to transition more into writing books and less about radio. But I still, I'm a great fan of public radio and very much enjoy doing radio. I have really researched the American Eclipse book. It sounds wonderful. Set the stage for us with that book because that just has got some characters in it, (laughs) in particular Thomas Edison. But tell us a little bit about who's there and what's kind of going on at this point in our uh, history, our American history. Right, absolutely. So my book, American Eclipse, tells the true story of a total solar eclipse that crossed the American West in 1878. And that was a a fascinating time in American history and a fascinating time also in astronomy. It was a period when total eclipses, which are extremely rare events, and I'll talk more about them in a a moment, uh, were were critically important to astronomy because in the mid to late 1800s, astronomers were just starting to ask questions about the sun. What is this great ball of fire in the sky? What fuels it? What What's it made out of? And there were certain studies that could only be done during a total solar eclipse. And a total eclipse only occurs about once every 18 months somewhere on the planet often somewhere really inconvenient, but astronomers would head off to India or Africa or wherever to sit in the path of where the eclipse would pass, uh, would, would pass and then do the, conduct their studies. So 1878, astronomers knew that a total eclipse was going to cross the American frontier from Montana territory down to Texas. And so many of the era's great scientists made plans to head out to the Wild West. And as you said, Uh, One of them was Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison in 1878 was 31 years old. He He had just become a global celebrity because of his invention of the phonograph. And as soon as the eclipse was over, when he returned to New Jersey, he started work on another invention, which was the incandescent light bulb. So the that summer of 1878 was a critically important time in the life of Thomas Edison and it's it's one that's 
has been written about very little because, of course, what came before and came after got so much more attention. But Thomas Edison that that summer went to Wyoming with a bunch of astronomers uh, to sit and wait for the total eclipse and to conduct his own studies of it. I got the impression in some of the research that I had done on you and this this your, your wonderful book, um, again, American Eclipse, that Edison almost needed to kind of by association prove himself a little bit as having some chops, so to speak, with regard to the science scientific community. Right. Well, it's interesting for those who've read biographies of Edison will probably know that that later in life, he he really kind of frowned on academic scientists, and he very much would say he was not a scientist. He was an inventor. But but that came after a period earlier in his life where he really uh, was very friendly with academic scientists, and you get the sense wanted their respect, and that's what was going on in 1878. He even earlier, um, a few years earlier in 1875, 1876, when he was not yet so well known, he had um, he had believed that he discovered a new fundamental force, like like electricity or gravity, and he called it the etheric force. And he he uh, announced his findings to the newspapers. He was in. He got a lot of attention for it, but very quickly, scientists. Uh, said he was wrong. He had it, he was what he really was seeing was electricity, and uh, it was a great embarrassment for Edison. Then even in 1878, after he'd come out with the phonograph and got a lot of uh, attention, very positive attention, obviously for that, people were still ridiculing him about the etheric force. And so in 1878, he was trying to prove that he really was a serious scientist and to get beyond that fiasco. And so in 1878, he was going to do his own astronomical research. He invented a device called the tesimeter, which was an extremely sensitive, essentially electric thermometer, an infrared detector that you could point at something and it would measure heat radiation coming off of it. And he developed it for astronomy. And he brought it out to Wyoming to conduct studies of what we know today is the sun's outer atmosphere, the solar corona, which is only visible during those two or three minutes of a total eclipse. And he went to Wyoming to use his tesimeter on the corona to see if it gave off heat as well as light. And so this was a very different Edison from the one we know today, an Edison who was conducting very basic scientific research, not just you know creating new inventions in his laboratory. This is one of those historic events involving Edison and these these really facts that took place that is going to be so fascinating to hear you talk about. Again, we're with David Barron, author of American Eclipse. David's going to be at the Smithsonian Associates Program on June 6th. That's going to be at the Ripley Center in downtown Washington, D.C. David's with us today. In addition to being an author... Uh, David is an admitted eclipse chaser. So, David, what are you going to be doing on August 21st, 2017? That's a, a special date, not just some random date, right? Absolutely. So, uh, I should say that the release of my book uh, in early June is very much timed to what's going to happen in August. Uh, because August 21st, 2017, uh, we will have the first total solar eclipse to touch um, the continental United States in 38 years. And indeed, this will be the first total solar eclipse to cross the country coast to coast in 99 years. Uh, On August 21st, the moon's shadow, and that's what a total solar eclipse is, you're standing in the shadow of the moon. Um, The moon's shadow will come ashore uh, on and in Oregon, about ten fifteen in the morning Pacific time, and it will race across the country at almost two thousand miles an hour, and and then leave our shores uh, in around Charleston, South Carolina, uh, in the afternoon, and uh, this so this will be a huge national event. Uh, there are 14 million people who live in that narrow path. It's 70 miles wide where you have to be between Oregon and South Carolina to see the total eclipse. Everyone else, I should say, will see a partial eclipse, but a total eclipse is really a fundamentally different experience. So 14 million people live in that zone. 
100 million people or more live within an easy day's drive. And believe me, as we're getting close to August 21st, you're going to hear about the eclipse everywhere. It's going to be huge. Millions of people will be on the move that day to get into the path of totality to witness something that really everyone should witness at least once in their life. So my story of the 1878 eclipse is meant to to use the August 21st eclipse, the modern one, as a teachable moment for a fascinating time in American history, as well as a teachable moment for astronomy. But I I say teachable moment, but it's just a a great fun story of these scientists out in the Wild West. I've had a chance to go to your website, David, which is American-Eclipse.com. We'll put that website address up in the notes and make sure and highlight that. But that's got lots of tips, lots of information, details. Uh, Just as you describe, I thought it was really interesting to look at the path of the eclipse. It's almost cutting a corner-to-corner sash, if you will, across the U.S., kind of from tip-top to the the southern, uh, southeastern shores. And it just looks like the place to be in order to to, to take full advantage of what we're going to be seeing during this period, this 99-year period. I've heard you talk a little bit about what it's like to be there during a total eclipse. Tell, tell our audience, give a sense as to what it really means, because it, it's, it's really like nothing else. It, it is, and, and a lot of people, it's, it's, it's hard to understand unless you've seen one, because many of us have seen, and you know, before I saw my first total eclipse, I'd certainly seen partial solar eclipses, and a partial eclipse is interesting. Uh, They happen every few years. One may pass overhead. Uh, And if you watch with special eclipse glasses, because of course it's never safe to look at the sun when any part of the solar surface is exposed. So during a partial eclipse, if you look through very dark eclipse glasses, they're much darker than just uh, sunglasses, you can see that the moon takes a bite out of the edge of the sun. And over time, that bite grows larger and larger, and the the sun eventually looks like a crescent moon. And it's all very interesting. But a total solar eclipse, which occurs if you're in the right spot when the moon finally goes completely over the sun so that there's no portion of the solar surface still visible, only at that time is it safe to look at the sun with the naked eye. Uh, and it's a very brief. A total eclipse usually lasts just two or three minutes. and But during that time, it's as if you've been transported to another planet. Because huh, when you take off your eclipse glasses, you're looking at a sky you've never seen before. It really, it's an alien sky. Here it is, the middle of the day, and suddenly you're plunged into twilight. And you're standing in the shadow of the moon. The blue sky has been ripped away, right? The blue sky that is overhead any day it's, it's a curtain. It keeps us from seeing what's up there. The stars are up there. The planets are up there. You just can't see them because the blue sky is in the way. Well, when the moon comes in and the shadow comes in, the blue sky is gone. And suddenly, you're looking toward the center of our solar system, but you can see. Uh, it's not dark like midnight, but it's like twilight. You can see bright stars, and you can definitely see the planets. And uh, and among the planets, you now see the sun, and it's a sun you've never seen before, because it's a great paradox that it's only when the sun is hidden by the moon that you actually can see the sun, because the sun is so bright, you can't look at it, right? You can't look at it, certainly with the naked eye, and you can't see the, what's around the sun, which is this glorious, it's, it's called the solar corona, it's the outer atmosphere, and pictures pictures just don't do it justice, because it's this glorious halo or wreath that's finely textured. It looks like it's made of strands of silk or cotton. And it has an interesting shape that's uh, influenced by the magnetic field lines of the sun. It's just something you've never seen before. And it's 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 hypnotizing. Uh, and sometimes, depending on the eclipse, uh, you'll also see these great red flames leaping off the sun, these so-called solar prominences. Um, and you're you're actually looking at the sun and looking at the planets at the same time. And so for me, when I saw my first total eclipse, which was in Aruba in 1998, that was one of the things that really grabbed me, that I was looking at the sun and the planets at the same time. It was as if I had 
left the solar system and was looking at some diagram of our solar system in a textbook where you see the sun in the middle and you see the, the planets lined up uh, in a plane on either side. And it just was a, a very moving, uh, I mean, deeply emotional experience for me. And a lot of eclipse chasers will say the same thing. And that's, it's not a scientific thing for me. It's a purely an emotional and spiritual thing. But of course, in 1878, the, the scientists who observed the eclipse back then, they were also very much moved uh, spiritually and emotionally as well. But they had a very clear scientific intent when they headed to the Wild West to observe the eclipse. So it was more academic then, and today it's really more about the beauty of it and just experiencing. Well, you know, it's interesting, y yes and no, <laughs> because there are still scientists who are conducting studies during the eclipse. They're, you know, they're asking much more, much smaller questions about exactly how the sun works. Back in the, the mid to late 1800s, there were very basic questions that had to be answered and could only be answered in an eclipse. But also, even back in the 1800s, the scientists would admit just, you know, they were going to the eclipse ostensibly to conduct science, but my God, they just wanted to experience it. And interesting, there's a Smithsonian connection because uh, for the eclipse of 1878, one of the scientists who was in Colorado was Samuel Pierpont Langley, who eventually went on to become the secretary of the Smithsonian. He was the third secretary of the Smithsonian. But in 1878, he headed the Allegheny Observatory in western Pennsylvania, and he observed the eclipse of 1878 from on top of Pikes Peak in Colorado, up at 14,000 feet, where he had to battle altitude sickness and snowstorms in July. And he admitted in a letter that I found at the National Archives, he admitted to one of his fellow astronomers that, you know, he, he was going out there to conduct studies, but really he had, he had seen two eclipses before, but he'd never really, he'd studied two eclipses before, but he'd never really seen an eclipse. And in 1878, for a number of reasons, his, he didn't have his equipment that he wanted with him. And he's basically spent the eclipse just looking at it, just looking at it with the naked eye and drawing what he saw. And he, he just was so moved. And he wrote in a letter uh, to um, one of his family members afterwards that, you know, he said, there's no use trying to describe it. He said, it's like an earthquake. Unless you've experienced it yourself, you really don't understand uh, what it's like to, to, to experience one. Well, David Barron, an award-winning journalist, author, broadcaster, you can just hear David's expertise. And you can hear this wonderful story, and we get to meet and see David in person on the 6th of June for the Smithsonian Associates Program. David's going to present his new book, American Eclipse, that is timed perfectly, David, I have to say, timed perfectly to this August 21st event. We'll put up links to David's site, American-Eclipse, where you can get lots of details, more information about uh, the event at Smithsonian, as well as the book, and the eclipse itself on the 21st. David Barron, thanks so much for joining us. I anything you want to leave us with? Because I, I know it will be great if you send us off with some special eclipse-related syzygy message. So tell us. <laughs> tell us. Syzygy, yes, a very good word. Okay. The <laughs> celestial alignment. Well, I might just I might just add, you know, I there there were so many interesting people who came out to the American West, and I I live in Colorado, and that's where I'm speaking to you from. There were many fascinating folks who came out to this part of the world in 1878, and I had a hard time deciding who to leave out of the story. But I should say, I mean, I mentioned Thomas Edison, I mentioned Samuel Pierpont Langley. There are several other major characters, but one of my favorites. Uh, was Mariah Mitchell. She was the uh, she taught astronomy at Vassar College back in 1878, and she in in that era was by far the most famous female scientist in the United States. And for her, the eclipse of 1878 wasn't so much a scientific uh, event; it was a political one. Because it was a time when women's higher education was was still just getting off the ground, off the ground, and actually was under attack. There were folks who said that that higher education was literally uh, not good for a woman's health, if you can believe it. Mm -hmm. And so, in 1878, Mariah Mitchell put together an all-female expedition to the Wild West to study the solar eclipse, and. 
uh, just her story of putting this expedition together and bringing these Vassar grads with her out to Colorado and the extent to which people here on the frontier were really moved by her and and impressed by her uh, you know it's it just was uh, a really inspirational story for me and I love that there's so much more to the eclipse of 1878 than science uh, it really says a lot about who we were as a country how we were evolving as a scientific nation the, the, the you know women's rights and all of that uh, I see it as a window into um, really America's uh, maturation at a time when we were becoming the nation we are today. An excellent side story, too. And, and on, as an aside, um, as part of the American History Museum uh, collection, uh, the actual telescope that Mariah Mitchell used during her professorship and directorship uh, of the observatory at Vassar Female College is there in uh, within that collection. So that's right. Good, good to bring that up. Very good to bring that up, David. And thank you again for joining us today. Just really appreciate it. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you, hearing you on uh, June sixth at uh, the Ripley David Barron Author of American Eclipse. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, David.